Hello, hello. Welcome to the Port St. Lucie Community Center. I see a couple returners. Glad to see you. Um, <clears throat> good evening, all. My name is Patty Roberts, and I am the Deputy Director here at the City of Port St. Lucie Parks and Recreation Department. So I am thrilled that we've got people in the audience, as well as hopefully joining us via Zoom um, to hear on this important topic. This is the seventh session of a program that is very near and dear to my heart. It's called Healthy You. It's called a series of conversations. And before I get into what Healthy You is and what tonight's topic is all about, um, I would like to uh, share a few general housekeeping um, items, please. At the registration table, there is a voluntary sign-in sheet, just strictly voluntary in case you wanna leave your name. You're not required to. Um, there is an opportunity for questions um, at the end of this presentation. For those of you in person, it's real easy. Just raise your hand. Um, if anyone is joining us via Zoom, feel free to put it in the uh, chat box. And that's my job. I'll be monitoring that and uh, answering those toward the end of the session as well. Um, so um, Healthy You, again, is a, a program very near and dear to my heart. It's um, only seven months old. Um, and what we've aimed to do with Healthy You is to uh, choose topics that are very um, sensitive in nature, that are tough to talk about, um, but are very needed in the community as far as raising awareness. Some of the topics that we've talked about are depression, anxiety, um, opioid epidemic. Um, that was the last session. We've done one on suicide prevention. Um, we are continuing this through at least December of this year. Um, and tonight's topic is bullying. And I do wanna share a couple of items on that topic um, before we actually introduce our subject matter expert. Um, but I do wanna talk about the days of COVID-19. Um, and I do appreciate those of you who are masked um, as we, if we are not social distancing, that's great. Um, but Healthy You is all about mental health issues. That's what we're here to talk about and how parks and recreation can be the connector for you. Um, so I've got some, some tools, some resources that I can share with you um, throughout the evening on what parks and rec can do for you. Um, but throughout COVID and pri just prior to the pandemic, now the world in which we live in is moving faster than ever before. Technology <laughs> has exploded and our means of connectivity is vastly different than from, our, from what our parents before us and how they connected and interacted with society. Many of us, due to circumstances outside of our control, feel isolated and unconnected with our loved ones, our colleagues, our associates. And this can leave us feeling depressed, out of touch, and with a weary outlook on life in general. Anxiousness has become our very way of life as we wake up each morning not really knowing what our day will be like given the pandemic and its impacts. Finances, food security, housing, employment, all prove to be huge factors that can heighten or exasperate anxiety in us all. And amid all this depression and anxiety, bullying and cyberbullying has taken on a new form. Being in the middle of a pandemic heightens our emotions and they aren't always expressed in a healthy manner. And that's why I'm so very proud of each and every one of you who have joined us today to talk about this very sensitive topic. So today, it's my extreme pleasure to share with you an important message from a subject matter expert on the topic of bullying. And I would like to just read um, some credentials about the woman who will be joining us and then she will be uh, sharing her presentation on bullying. The pre subject matter expert tonight is uh, Gretchen Reyes Ayala, and she is a civilian crime prevention practitioner and 2012 transplant to the Port St. Lucie area. Gretchen came to PSLPD Police Department after serving as a case manager in the Missing Children's Division at the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Gretchen's caseload was primarily focused 
on the identification of child sex trafficking victims and working to resolve long-term missing children cases. Prior to that, Gretchen worked as a civilian with the city of Tampa uh, Police Department. Gretchen began as a police dispatcher, then worked as a community service officer, originating police reports for non-emergent investigations. Upon promotion to investigative assistant, Gretchen handled runaway juvenile cases, sex offenses, a unique perspective into the source of different types of crime and useful insight as to how they can be prevented. And so with no further ado, I pr present to you and share with you Ms. Gretchen Reza Ayella. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patty. I very much appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, can you just give me a thumbs up, Patty, if you can hear me okay? Excellent, thank you. Yes, ma'am, I hear you fine. Thank you. Uh, for everyone who is there, um, I genuinely apologize for not being there in person with you. Uh, my intent was absolutely to be there to share this event with you. But again, we're in the age of COVID. Um, unfortunately, um, I, was, uh, I was inadvertently exposed and now I have to quarantine in my home. So, um, I do want to apologize up front if you hear any dogs barking or little children yelling. Um, that's going on outside of the room that I'm in. Um, and you know, that's life at home sometimes. So I just, uh, I would appreciate your forbearance and um, just bear with us here. Uh, but tonight we do wanna share with you some information about bullying and cyberbullying. Um, as Patty said, since all of this, um, Technology, with because of the COVID uh, issues, have taken us online. We've seen issues um, involving the internet and children just explode, um, and internet and adults, for that matter. So it's really important that we be able to talk about these things. Um, we're certainly happy to address any questions that you have as we're, um, you know, we get to the end of the presentation. If you just kind of save them till then, um, I would love to uh, to answer and to help you whatever with whatever we can. Um, we do also have Officer Russ Jackson there, um, and he will be uh, available to assist with answering questions and, and helping with the presentation along the way as well. So um, now if I can just have our tech person help me out here. I need to share my screen so you can see the PowerPoint. Yep, it's on the bottom, Gretchen, on the share screen. Okay, I'm not. I'm and you want to share the actual PowerPoint? Seeing, yeah, I'm not seeing anything that says share screen. I just have a little screen on the left that. You go ahead and click on that. You probably this? just need to maximize the screen. Oh, oh there we go. I apologize. <laughs> Um, this is my first time doing this this way. So I, again, my sincere apologies to everyone in the room. Um, so yeah, we're gonna. Yep, and I just go ahead and start the presentation. Okay, bear with me, I have to, I'm sorry. I'm trying to do this on a laptop with a very little screen and um, go to go to slideshow. Yep, I got yep. it. And then from the beginning, there you go. Okay, is everybody seeing that full screen now? Yeah, we got it. Yes, beautiful, perfect. Yes, um, again, yes. thank you for your, your forbearance here as we get through this. So, um, Obviously, this is going to be presented by the Port St. Lucie Parks and Recreation Department uh, as part of their Healthy You program. Uh, so tonight, um, like I said, you'll have in the room Officer Russ Jackson, and uh, that's me, Gretchen. Um, 
So bullying, what is it? Um, the federal government website on bullying defines it this way. I'm sorry, there we go. Um, in order to be considered bullying, the behavior has to be aggressive um, and there has to be an inclusion of an imbalance of power. So, um, you know, such as like power, like physical strength, um, access to information that might embarrass you. Um, and that is used to control or harm you. Um, it, it's, it's meant to um, maybe take away some of your popularity or keeping you from being popular. Um, and um, power, power imbalances, they can change over time, even if it involves all of the same people. Um, bullying behavior also is repetitious. So it's something that happens more than one time. It's something that is repeated and um, has the potential to be repeated. It includes actions like, you know, making threats, spreading rumors, attacking someone physically, verbally, um, or excluding them from a group intentionally, you know, on purpose. So those types of things are what the federal government looks at when it is defining bullying. Now, as far as the Florida Department of Education is concerned, um, and um, I understand we do have some students that are in the uh, public education system here in Florida in the room. Is that correct, Patty? Could you just let me know? Yes. Just, you can just shake your head. We've got a wide variety of ages in here. Um, the okay. group that we told you about, though, I don't, I don't see yet. Okay. All right. So, uh, but as far as the Department of Education is concerned, um, they define it as being systematic and chronic. Um, it includes physically harming or hurting someone or causing psychological distress um, on students and employees. And that's important to understand, employees being teachers, administrators, um, and the like. Um, and it has to be severe. Um, severe enough to cause intimidation, hostility, or some si sort of um, offensive environment. The, um, and that environment then will interfere with a person's ability to learn in school or with a teacher's ability to effectively teach a class. So um, the whole um, premise there is there is a disruption. Now, um, I, get, I apologize, I, I genuinely apologize for the barking. So um, bullying, it's, it's always ongoing. It's always deliberate. Um, those are some really key issues. That misuse of power in relationships through the repeated verbal, uh, physical and social behavior that's intended to cause the um, misuse of the power, it's intent, you know, the intent is they want to abuse and misuse that power. And so it can happen on person, it can happen online, um, it can happen um, so that it's obvious or what we would call overt, or it can be hidden, so it's covert. So the bully doesn't wanna be found out. So they're doing things sort of on the sly to keep it um, under wraps from everyone except their intended victim. Um, or um, you know, the person that is the target of their aggression. Um, but bullying in any form. Gretchen, can you hear us? In, yeah, I can hear you now. Can you hear me? You were cutting out a little bit, but yes, continue please. I'm so sorry. I, I, again, my apologies to everyone who is there in person. Um, but bullying in any form um, can have immediate and long-term effects on the people that are involved, even people who might be not necessarily the target, but a bystander. So um, you can see with that type of definition, how it transcends just beyond our youth, just beyond children. And it can, it can be pervasive into the college uh, campuses and even into the workplace. So um, it's just an understanding that it's not something that is solely um, and 
typically it typically it's a, a problem for youth, but it's not solely a problem for youth, if that makes sense. Um, and when you understand it from this perspective, you can also understand that bullying in a, an interpersonal relationship, maybe like a dating relationship, um, that's kind of the first step sometimes to dating violence and to domestic abuse. The first behavior is bullying behavior. So that's why it's extremely important to understand what it is and so that you can recognize it and identify it and maybe stop uh, or end a relationship before it ever gets you to the point that there is dating or physical violence. So direct bullying is bullying that it, it happens face to face. So it includes um, physical acts of violence. It includes things like hitting people, kicking people, tripping them. Um, it includes name calling, insults, threats, and extortion. So, um, you know, we all used to hear the stories about, you know, the kid in the lunchroom who would steal the lunch money and, and you know, that was all kind of funny back then. Um, but technically that could be construed as extortion depending on the circumstances. So just things to be aware of that this is, you know, this is not um, something that should be taken lightly. Um, it's, it's something that's very negatively impactful when you have this face-to-face -face or this direct bullying, particularly when it gets to the point of physical violence. So indirect bullying is something that it's, it's gossiping, um, it's done behind the person's back. Uh, the intent is to um, you know, sway someone else's victim, uh, opinion of the victim. They want to influence other people by spreading maybe untrue rumors or just straight up telling them, hey, don't be friends with that person. Um, they're not necessarily doing anything physically to that person directly, but they're still, they're harming them socially. And that social harm is considered bullying. Um, anything that is done that's going to damage your reputation with someone else with, with the a purpose of being intentionally hurtful can be construed as indirect bullying. So there's several different types of bullies. Um, research generally indicates that there's three types. The aggressive bully, that's your most common type of bully. Um, these are individuals, they're fearless. They are belligerent, they're coercive, they're tough and they're impulsive, which is part of the problem. That impulsivity not being under control is a, a big part of what feeds that aggression in them. Um, they really have a low tolerance for anything that frustrates them. Um, and that again, you know, feeds that inclination that they have toward acting out in aggressive or even violent manners. Um, they generally will initiate the aggression towards their peers. They're not usually reactionary. They're usually, um, why they call it aggressive, they're the primary aggressor in the situation. Now, passive bullies, they rarely um, seek people out to bully specifically like the aggressive bully does. These are people that kind of come behind and join in that aggress with that aggressive bully. They wanna gain the approval of the bully. And a lot of times they see that in sort of like a self-preservation type of uh, mentality that, hey, if I'm on his good side, well, that bully is not gonna hurt me. He or she is not gonna hurt me. So the passive bully joins in that behavior. Now, again, they have to have almost sort of a um, proclivity to having uh, to join in on that as opposed to standing up against it or not participating in it. Um, so the next group is going to be the bully victims. And these are people who themselves have been the victims of bullying. And then they get so frustrated that they resort to bullying other people. And um, bully victims, it's different than um, 
someone who says I've had enough and they decide to just, you know, slug the bully and, and try to get them to stop bullying them that way. This is a different type. They are not acting out against the person that's bullying them. They're acting against other people that they feel they can bully themselves. Um, and then researchers have kind of identified a fourth group as of late. And they're called relational bullies. And this is really a group that's um, predominantly girls and women, females. Um, and it's, they try to gain social status um, by the excluding others. So I know we've seen some pretty famous movies with some very famous examples of girls behaving in that way. Um, but ultimately what it is, is they are relational bullies. So it's all about relationships for them and making sure that they're on top of the relationship world. So <clears throat> why, why do people do this? Why are, why are they engaging in this kind of behavior? So the researchers have not been able to identify any one specific thing that says, uh, you're, you know, this is what causes an individual to become a bully. They have, identified a couple of factors that seem to indicate what influences the behavior. And so um, primarily it's fam family dynamics. What is going on in the bully's home? How are the uh, family members relating to one another in that household, right? Um, and so how they do that has an impact on how children learn then to be in relationship with other people. Um, children who experience the bullying at home, uh, many times, many times, they will develop the same types of bullying behaviors themselves. Um, and just the same, even if they're not the specific uh, target of the bullying in the home, if dad is being more of a bully to mom, or there's a, a, you know, an older sibling who's being more of a bully to a younger sibling and not that particular one, um, when they witness those bullying behaviors, that tends to influence them and they're likely to act out in the same manner. If they're developing um, their, their sense of how you relate to people and in the family, in the home, that's where that's really cemented and solidified. So that's a big part of where this is coming from many, many times is what's going on in the home. Um, some other things to think about is uh, school culture. Um, now, I think a lot of people are surprised to learn that because here in Florida, particularly, um, we have school culture that really has a no tolerance for bully stance, right? Um, Florida has been very, very good as far as getting out ahead of this and, and putting things in place with regard to that issue, particularly in the public school system. Uh, but that is not true everywhere. Um, and so uh, there are schools where bullying is uh, ignored by educators. Um, there's no disciplinary action that they take when a uh, bully is engaged in any kind of negative behavior. And so the, uh, those behaviors become viewed as permissible and they're consequently then viewed as acceptable. And that empowers these bullies to continue to act. So depending on where someone might have come from, um, as far as a school culture, that could have been an influence that caused them to engage in bullying behavior. Um, and then, you know, when you see peers that are engaged in that, um, when, um, you know, you see, as a child, you see that your friend, uh, it, you know, you don't recognize that they're a bully, but you see that behavior, well, then you can draw a conclusion, well, hey, that's acceptable behavior. And so, you know, they might be able to um, adopt that in their own way of relating with their peers. Um, and so they just, they'll join in or they join in as a means of gaining acceptance. Um, it's, you know, there's just different motivations there when it comes to the peer arena. Now, as far as bullying behaviors that are depicted in our media, right? And when I say media, we're talking about films, television, video games, um, you know, that influences children and allows them to draw the conclusion that bullying behavior is okay. 
because in a, a lot of times what we see in the media is that bullying can be, tra- be portrayed as comical. It's funny, right? It's, it's um, if you think about the movie Boss Baby, if anybody saw the movie Boss Baby, not that I'm throwing them under the bus, but um, you know, that behavior was, um, it was emulated, it was on the forefront. And a lot of times the bully is the, um, you know, the, the one that achieves great success. That's how they get their power. That's how they get to the top in their business world. And so that depiction then tends to relate down and, you know, send out that message ultimately, hey, you want to get on top, you got to bully your way there. And that message gets, um, you know, reiterated through different forms. Um, So, you know, as these get uh, reinforced and they get ingrained in the bully, it all becomes normal to them. They don't see a problem with the behavior. Uh, In the adult world, though, that's exactly how we end up with bully bosses. Uh, And the Workplace Bullying Institute conducted a, uh, a, a large scale survey. And it was done in 2017. Uh, Their research determined that over 60 million, so six zero million workers are impacted by bullying in the workplace. So 61% of those reporting said that the bully was their boss. Um, And so, you know, we can't assume then that kids will grow out of bullying behavior. Uh, or that as they mature, they'll develop a different pattern or a different type of behavior. Um, Because ultimately we see that that behavior carries on into adulthood and then um, many, many times into the workplace. Now, unfortunately, there's another place that bullying behavior leads. And um, there's a book called Nobody Left to Hate. The author is uh, Elliot Aronson. Um, And he cited research revealing that bullies tend to grow more hostile over time. It doesn't get better, it actually gets worse. So by age 24, two thirds of the boys who were bullied or who were bullies in elementary school had been convicted of three or more crimes. And typically those are violent offenses, okay? So, you know, we're talking about things like battery. We're talking about, you know, um, really things that, that harm people. So violent felony offenses. Um, and they'd already served time in prison by the age of 24. That's really startling and very disconcerting. Um, so w- in light of that, we can see how recognizing and addressing uh, the behavior when hostility is displayed in youth it has the potential to change the trajectory over the course of someone's life, right? So um, where we're thinking, uh, you know, well, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to deal with them. We don't want to stand up to them. We don't want to address this issue. Um, Really, if, if we don't, and we don't get that intervention in at an early place and get the resources in place, um, get them connected through um, resources that are available to us through places like the community center, through social services, those kind of things, counseling, then that, that person has a potential ultimately to grow up to engage in violent felony acts and ultimately end up in prison. And we certainly don't want to see that for anyone. So technology. <laughs> the advent of computer networks um, has... Um, which is referred to, of course, as cyberspace, that has allowed bullying to move from the traditional school or work environment into completely new realms, right? So the internet, our cell phones, um, those have positioned bullies to be able to really terrorize more victims than ever before. And they're able to do it with a sense of anonymity, because they're hiding behind those computers. They're hiding behind those cell phones. Um, and so they can, you know, they can easily ideal their, their true identity. Um, and unfortunately, technology has almost inadvertently made it more difficult for um, people in positions of authority to kind of deal with this uh, because they, um, you know, it, it's hard to track down every single person that's on the computer doing something 
when you have literally millions and millions of people on the, you know, on the computers in the world doing something. So, um, you know, this is just empowered bullies. They're becoming more aggressive than ever before. And um, it's really taking the whole uh, fear that people are, are developing. Um, it's, it's taking it to a whole new level because, you know, um, you literally, you have your phone in your hand. So even though that bully is not physically close to you, there's still that feeling of proximity that they're in your world, they're in your technology, they're in your computer. So it's, um, it, it's driving anxiety and fear in victims to levels never seen before. So who are they targeting? Um, that depends on a lot of different characteristics, um, but there are a few similarities that have been identified in victims. Um, many times the target has no few or no friends. Um, it's someone who's just um, not got any kind of support system, um, whether it's in school or whether it's in the workplace. Um, and they don't, not only do they not have the support of a friend, but they don't have a witness. There's no one else that's standing to see, hey, you know, this person did this to this person. Um, so it leaves them sort of um, in a position where it's their word against the bullies. And bullies are very convincing when it comes to um, not being held accountable for their actions. Um, and so the, the victim likely has very low self-esteem. Um, they really lack a sense of resiliency. So they're not bouncing back and um, after the bully displays whatever behavior or takes whatever action against them, they're not bouncing back from that. It's actually driving down their self-esteem. Um, and that's where we really have to be concerned and we have to make sure that we're intervening for the people who are being bullied. Um, the victim's likely not going to stand up for his or herself. Um, and so they're not gonna fight back against the bully. Very rarely will you see that happen. And typically, if you do see that happen, there's extraordinarily negative consequences when it does. And it doesn't usually work out well for the victim or the target of the bullying to, uh, to try to uh, fight back. Um, many times, the target um, is perceived as being odd or quirky or uh, different in some way that um, the, the, the bully he's up on. Um, and, you know, it could be things like they might be taller than everyone else at that age. They might be shorter. They might be thinner. They might be heavier, um, you know, than, than their peers. They might wear glasses. They might have braces. Um, they may not have expensive clothes. Um, you know, they're on and on and on. A bully can find something and it's usually something that the target um, is already keenly aware of. They, this is already, you know, they're already uncomfortable about wearing braces. They're already uncomfortable about wearing glasses. They're already uncomfortable that they don't have the latest and greatest technology because, you know, their family just can't afford that. Um, and so, you know, those things make them more self-conscious about it. And then you have, um, you know, you have people who are targeted because of things like being on the autism spectrum. Um, somebody might have a speech impediment, someone walking with a limp. Um, those are issues that get honed in on, but they're so far beyond, they're, they're completely beyond the control of the target or the victim. And so, um, you know, it's, it gives the bully more gratification that they're able to pick on something that they know intentionally they are chipping away at the self-esteem of the, the target. Um, and so, it, you know, as far as from the target side, the victim side, because they're already aware of it, because they know it's a problem, it just impacts them at a much, much deeper level. Um, again, and that's, that's why we have to be so concerned. So what happens later on is that Bully students, uh, bullied students, many times, they'll become truant. Um, and if you're not familiar with that term is, it means that you're absent from school without a uh, guardian or parent's permission and without a good reason. Um, and so, but they'd rather skip school. They'd rather stay home 
then go to school and deal with the abuse that is going to be heaped on them by that bully. Uh, the consequences of skipping school are simply nowhere near what um, they're going to have to deal with if they go to school and have to deal with that bully. Um, they really don't have any regard for, you know, consequences of, uh, you know, that the school administration might put on them for skipping school. It doesn't matter. The only focus is I have to, I can't go to school because that person's going to do X, Y, or Z to me. Um, and I just know they're going to do it. So, you know, there's, there's no regard for long-term implications that the absence from school is going to put in place. And there's no, um, there's no thinking beyond to, you know, gosh, if I want to go on to college, I have to have attended, you know, I've had to have had good attendance at school. The, the focus never moves beyond what that bully is going to do to me in school that day. So um, compared to peers of their same age, uh, bullying victims are five times more likely to suffer from depression. Um, and so male victims are more four, four times more likely to be suicidal. Girls are eight times more likely to be suicidal. And that's very alarming. It is very, very alarming. Um, many of those who do successfully commit suicide will leave a note detailing what they endured because they want somebody to know, but they didn't feel like they could tell them before they took the action that took their own lives. So the, the reason that we talk about that aspect is that it is critical critical that we are paying attention for signs of depression in our teens and in our, um, you know, our young adults, because that depression might actually be a, a, a clue that there's something else going on, that there is someone who is repeatedly bullying them. So you need to be keenly aware if you start seeing the signs of depression that, um, you know, that could be a cause of it. Um, an emotional intelligence study po uh, published by Daniel Goldman revealed that the victims of bullying will carry negative feelings with them into adulthood. So unless they get counseling, unless they have, um, you know, and sometimes even trauma specialized counseling, they're going to carry that negativity with them. Their overall self-esteem is going to uh, be significantly lower. And this is a result of things that happened at, from child, you know, developed in childhood torment. So again, very, very important. We have to take this very seriously because not only, you know, are we looking at bullies who could ultimately end up, you know, with their lives in prison, but you're looking at people who just are not going to move forward in life. They're going to, um, you know, they're not going to get to live their best life because they're still traumatized by what has occurred. Now, there have been multiple, multiple document in, documented instances where bully victims use violence as a means of revenge. Um, and that, you know, whether they were school students, warehouse workers, um, violent responses to bullying behavior, that's left a path of destruction across not only their own lives, but the lives of the people who are unfortunately near them. Um, because um, a study of school shooters who did not um, ultimately um, die during the school shooting event, who didn't take their own lives, uh, provided startling insight into the reason for their action. Um, and more than two thirds of them stated they had been bullied and the shooting was done for revenge. Now, we're not going to know with some instance, instances because some of those um, active shooters, they took their own lives and we don't know what their motivation was. They didn't tell us if bullying was a factor. Um, but we can pretty much assume that it is if two thirds of those who are still alive after the event are telling us bullying fed into it or bullying was a factor. Um, they, but the really startling part about it is that they didn't just exact revenge on the person who bullied them. 
Um, many times they targeted teachers or administrators that they felt didn't do anything to help them. Um, and, you know, they, anybody who they perceived could have taken some action to stop the bullying against them and didn't, um, they will target them. And for the rest of it, they just say that, oh, well, you know, those, they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. That's how they sort of justify it to themselves. Um, that, you know, those other people were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, and that, you know, same thing holds true for mass violence in the workplace. Um, you know, when employees are continuously and systematically bullied, the results can be deadly. And many times they are deadly. Um, hey, Gretchen, the problem is for some so reason we lost your sound. Oh, never mind. I'm, never mind, you're back. Okay, yep, sorry. Yep, we got you. Okay. okay. Um, so the problem in the workforce is so great that the United States Department of Labor, um, Occupational Safety and uh, Health Administration, or OSHA, um, they have a section on their website dedicated to recognizing the signs that violence might be forthcoming um, from someone who's been the victim of bullying in the workplace. Um, so it's something that we all need to be paying attention to um, because we just never know from one moment to the next what is going to send someone over the edge, whether it is a, a youth who takes violence, um, you know, revenge against someone else or takes and then plans to take their own life afterward or a coworker. And again, I genuinely apologize for the dog barking in the background. Um, he's very, very protective and um, he's very, very convinced that the squirrels around this house are coming to get us. Um, so what do we do? Well, first of all, uh, we take it seriously. We take it seriously. And I apologize for that typo. We take it seriously. Um, to address the issue, we have to understand that um, for our youth in particular, bullying is a very, very real problem. Um, before they ever tell an adult, some youth make up their mind that it's just not worth it. Nobody cares, no one's going to do anything about it. So they're gonna suffer in silence. Um, and they get those notions because they might've seen it happen to another friend or they've seen um, you know, something where um, they've, they've got a message, some other action has occurred, a message that was received by them or perceived by them that no one wants to help them. Nobody's gonna do anything about it anyway. Um, and they might be, um, you know, predetermining that, hey, it's my fault. If I wasn't fat, if I wasn't short, if I wasn't this or that or the other thing, or if I was uh, taller, if I was, then they wouldn't pick on me. So it must be my fault. They take it and they internalize it. Um, so they feel like because of that, there's just nothing that can be done. Um, so that's why it's crucial, really, really crucial that adults or anybody in a position of authority to take a report about bullying um, does so. Um, not only for the benefit of the, the child or the person that's at the center of it, but you don't know who else is watching, right? We don't know what other students are, are looking to see, hey, you know, uh, Mr. So-and-so handled this this way or Mrs. So-and-so handled it that way um, because they themselves have something going on that they wanna report. So it's extraordinarily important that um, you know, there's this mindset, this understanding that it's not just about the person reporting it, but the people who are watching around it. Um, it's really, really of the utmost importance that we validate the perceptions of the target, of the, of the victim of the bullying. Um, very, very important that it's validated uh, because being dismissive only compounds the problem for the person who's being bullied. It doesn't, um, it doesn't empower them in any way. And um, to them, it is a big deal. And you might look at the situation and think, well, you know, that's very, very minor. That's not really even bullying. But to them, it's a big deal. And so you've got to validate their perceptions. And, you know, then you want to make sure 
that you have open communication, right? Uh, that um, when they're, you know, you're getting them to communicate with you about what the situation is, that you're doing it without judgment. Um, it's very, very difficult for them to come and make that report or tell anyone, tell anyone in the first place, right? Um, they have, you know, again, we're talking about low self-esteem issues. We're talking about fear, uh, fear of retaliation. So um, having open, non-judgmental communication is crucial to the person who is the target of the bullying. Um, and it's, you know, it's paramount uh, to address um, and resolve it in any form and in any forum, uh, whether school, whether the workplace. So um, we don't wanna neglect this part. Um, it's adults in any profession, but especially those that are working in the education field, um, it's really Im critical, imperative that you take the bullying seriously. Um, and you have to model the behavior that you expect from your students. Sometimes um, teachers and, and almost bully the students and they don't even realize that that is in fact what they're doing or how it's being perceived. So um, very, very important that we are self-aware uh, and that we are making sure we're modeling what we expect from them. Um, so strengthening adult social skills, um, you wanna do that through effective communication courses, uh, development of anger management strategies, that's huge and uh, strong problem solving skill sets. Those are assets to teachers and administrators, right? They're huge assets. Um, and then human resources professionals that are fully trained in these areas, well, they can partner with um, like employee assistance programs and um, things like that to provide the resources that help negate bullying behaviors in the workplace. Um, and then anyone who is in a position of authority, um, whether dealing with children or adults, would benefit from a course in conflict resolution. And that's because you need to be able to recognize and address bullying behaviors separate and apart from conflict resolution. Because a lot of times those two worlds kind of get murky and they get marred. Um, but it's really important to understand the difference between those two things. Um, so ideally, we want to be able to say, you know, like, oh, let's just all get along, right? Well, the guiding principle behind conflict resolution is that both parties have a role to play in resolving the conflict, right? I'm going to do this part, you're going to do this part, and then we're going to come together. Um, that is not appropriate for bullying situations. You do not want to put the victim of bullying in a position where they're having to apologize or they're having to in any way, shape or form um, take responsibility in a situation where they're being bullied because that's even more detrimental to them. Um, you don't want them to have to compromise with someone who's tormenting them. Um, the, you know, bullying victims need to be reassured that they are not to blame. The blame lies squarely on the shoulder of the bully, on the shoulders of the person doing the bullying. And so um, they, um, the bully, bullying victim needs a protection plan. Um, they need someone to help them to stay safe, help them to bolster their self-esteem. The bully needs to be held accountable for their actions and intervention from professionals who can aid in understanding what the driving force is that is causing this person to act out in, you know, with these bullying behaviors. And so, uh, or, you know, or with that aggression. Um, and the bully needs to be very closely monitored to make sure that there's no retaliation against the victim. Because once a spotlight is put on their action, it really tends to make them angry. And that is actually when the bullying victim is the most susceptible to the most violence and aggression. 
So very, very crucial that anybody in a position of authority understands and is able to discern the difference between bullying behaviors and conflict resolution. You need to know what it is and what it's not. So next. Um, for those who are being bullied, uh, they really need support. They need, we need to listen, we need to focus on what they're telling us when they're finally ready to tell us or able to tell us. Um, we need to know what's going on and they need to know that we want to help. Um, we need to assure them that the bullying is not their fault. Um, they, and you know, kids who are being bullied, they really struggle to talk about it. Um, even adults, you know, they struggle to talk about it. So we want to make sure that if that's going on, there's intervention from maybe like the school guidance counselor, um, a psychologist, or any other kind of mental health professional. Um, and they need to be given advice on how to respond. Um, you know, and again, this is one of those things where, you know, they might not know it, how, how they're supposed to, to, what they should say if a bully is, is enacting a certain behavior. So with some role-playing things, they can help get their little confidence built up to, you know, no, listen, this is how I'm going to respond. I'm going to walk away and I'm go, going to go immediately to the closest teacher, to the, you know, uh, nearest responsible adult, and I'm going to let them know what just happened. So, um, you know, we all have to work together, though, to um, resolve the situation and particularly to protect the bully child. Um, the child, the parents, the school, um, they all have valuable input. Um, but, you know, it might be really helpful to ask the child, what would make you feel safe? What can we do? Um, and remember that changes to the routine, they need to be minimized. Um, you know, again, the bullied child is not at fault. So if they're scheduling changes, um, or, you know, seating changes, uh, don't move the bullied child. You know, if you're gonna if you're gonna move, shift the whole class, um, so that that child does not feel singled out for having you know brought to the attention you know that they were being bullied. Um, so any bus routines, that kind of thing, the bullied child should never be the one that is asked solely to change. It puts a giant spotlight on them. Uh, you have to develop a game plan and maintain open, open communication all the time, schools, organizations, and parents. And that's where having resources, like um, we have through Parks and Rec and our community center, that's an extraordinary place where those resources can be pulled in and utilized. Um, but they, um, you know, one thing you do have to remember is that the law does not allow for school personnel to discuss discipline, consequences, services, those kind of things. Um, so, you know, um, even though, you know, as a, um, as a city organization that wants to support the, the victims and uh, who are dealing with these things, um, you know, you just have to understand that there are limitations to what we can be told from officials. Um, really, really important. Um, we don't want to, um, ever uh, tell the child to ignore the bullying. It's not something we ever, ever want to ignore. Um, we don't blame them for being bullied. We don't tell them to physically fight back, as I said to, or earlier, that never goes well for the bullied child. Um, and that's why many times they resort to things like using a weapon. Um, so, you know, parents don't call up the other parent. Um, you know, that's something that needs to be mediated. And it's something that, again, could bring even more negative consequences for the child being bullied. Um, you know, these same steps, they're true in the workplace. Um, the difference being that in the workplace, you can involve things like your HR department, um, you know, depending on what kind of work you do, you might have a chain of command, or you might have a series of supervisors that can intervene, and they're responsible for taking those actions. So, um, you know, it's, it comes down to just making sure you understand how your corporate policy works and that kind of thing. 
And then for adults, you know, if all else fails, you always have the option of finding, you know, work elsewhere. And ideally nobody wants to do that, right? But if it's, if the environment's that toxic, it doesn't matter how good of an employee you are, it's still going to be toxic. So, um, you know, if you are going to do something like that, though, if you're going to change jobs, then I would say do some self-evaluation first, right? So um, we know that children who grow up with a parent who's a narcissist, for example, they tend to seek, you know, inadvertently end up, you know, being in positions where they're either working for a narcissist or they're living with a narcissist or those kind of things. So some self-evaluation before you make those changes might help you identify some areas within yourself that you could bolster up to make sure you're not just walking into the same sort of toxic environment when you change jobs. So really, really important. Um, the United States Department of Health and Human Services Stop Bullying on the Spot campa campaign um, identified additional action steps, noting that when adults respond quickly and consistently to bullying behavior, they send a message that it's not acceptable. And research shows that over time that can make it stop. Um, so there are simple steps that you know you can be taken to keep the kids safe. Safe. Um, number one, if you see something it's in progress, you need to intervene immediately. Even if you have to involve another adult, um, you've got to separate the kids involved. Uh, make sure everyone is safe, and make sure that if there are any immediate medical or um, mental health needs, that those are addressed in that moment. Um, you know, stay calm, reassure the kids uh, involved, including the bystanders, that it's going to be okay, the situation's under control, and you want to model the respectful behavior when you intervene. You want to make sure that you don't come into this intervention looking like a bully yourself. Um, so again, you know, you don't ignore it. Do not expect that these kids are going to work it out on their own. That's not appropriate with a bullying scenario. Um, don't immediately try to sort out all the facts and don't try to do it when everybody's together because there's a level of intimidation there. Remember, it's a balance of power. And so um, you're putting the bullied child at a very unfair disadvantage if you try to do that in that moment. Um, and um, you know, don't, don't talk to them collectively. You need to have one-on-one -on -one conversations in a moment where they're comfortable and they feel safe to tell you what is actually going on. Um, and never ever in those scenarios make both children stand there and apologize to one another because again, it's that same thing. You're putting a child who's been uh, the victim of a bully in a position where they're having to apologize to the person who's harming them. And that's not, it's never appropriate. So when do you call for help? Um, you know, obviously, like we said, you get police uh, help or medical attention. Um, number one, if a weapon is involved, uh, if there are threats of serious physical injury, or if there are serious physical injuries, um, there's, you know, threats of hate motivated violence, you know, something that's being done based on, um, you know, issues of racism or homophobia, those kind of things. Those are, um, you know, places where the police need to intervene. Um, anytime there's any kind of concern about uh, physical or um, other types of abuse, um, again, I don't know how old some of the people are in the room, so I'm assuming that there are some adults that can understand what I'm alluding to. Um, and then of course, if anyone is, you know, if there's any obvious criminal acts involved, um, you know, uh, extortion, robbery, any, anything that constitutes a, a crime, we definitely want to intervene, get the police to intervene. Now, very important to understand that the Florida Department of Education, um, because we are in the state of Florida, our students are protected. Uh, Florida State Statute 1006.147 um, fully defines that bullying and harassment are prohibited. Um, and that's in the K to 20 education code support for learning um, is, is the title. You can look that up online for yourself. Don't take my word for it. Um, but it's, um, they cite it as the Jeffrey Johnson Stand Up for All Students Act. 
And basically it says bullying or harassment of any student or employee of a public K-12 educational institution is prohibited. That's what you really need to know. It's prohibited. It's against the, you know, it is against state statute. Um, and that includes during school events, after school events, um, you know, uh, the use of computers, uh, school computers, and even things that impact learning from the home computer. So really, really important that, you know, uh, bullies understand that, that, hey, if you're doing something at home, you think it doesn't have anything to do with school, but it's disrupting the school, you could still be in violation. Um, so there are specific um, requirements in the state that every school district, every school has an anti-bullying policy. It's mandatory. Um, there are mandatory requirements for how that information is shared so that every parent and every student understands what that policy is. Um, and it has to be adhered to. It's not a, um, it's not optional. So, um, you know, now in the workplace, that's a little different. There might be employee handbooks, those kind of things. Again, you have to understand what the culture is in your own, um, in the workplace. Now, cyberbullying. Um, it's more challenging to address. Um, if you'll notice at the bottom of the screen, and I hope you can see it well um, from the, the screen sharing perspective, but you'll see there that there is a web address for you. Um, that web address is for the, um, a download, it's a PDF that you can download, um, and it specifically addresses issues regarding cyberbullying. Um, and cyberbullying, you know, it's defined as willful and repeated harm inflicted through the use of computers, cell phones, and other electronic devices. So um, anytime anybody's using technology to harass, threaten, humiliate, or, or anything else with their peers, um, it, it can be considered cyberbullying. Um, and since these kids are connected continuously to their technology, um, you know, it makes these bullies act on their own impulses that, um, you know, they feel like they're, they can just be cruel to someone um, and they can do it nearly nonstop. The um, people really fail to understand the impact that cyberbullying can have. Um, and again, it's, you know, it's, it's because they don't recognize the connection between having that computer right in your face or having that phone in your hand, um, it's just as frightening as having that person face-to-face -face with you, um, especially if you don't know who the person is on the other end of that uh, technology. So really, really important, particularly for parents, you have got to be aware of what's going on in your children's online activity. Um, Educators have policies in place, but they don't necessarily have all of the resources to effectively police that per se. Um, so it's really, really imperative that parents stay on top of it. And for law enforcement, there has to be clear, clear evidence that a crime has been committed. Um, now in our state, um, one of the things that it, um, it becomes is to, you know, it many times rolls over into cyber stalking. Um, but there's very specific criteria for that, and you have to be able to demonstrate it to law enforcement so that they can take action. Um, so the Department of Health and Human Resources, they're the ones that put together this guide that is referenced there at the bottom. Um, it's really easily downloaded in that PDF format, and um, it's, you know, it's something I recommend that later on tonight you go home, download it, read through it filter out what you feel is appropriate to share with your kids, um, or with your neighbors or whomever, but really, really good resource for information. So um, I hope everyone has had a chance to take a quick picture of that with their cell phone. Anybody else need a minute to do that? Are we good to go? I believe we're good to go, Gretchen. Beautiful, thank you, Patty. So um, cyberbullying has thrust this whole issue um, into a world where they're just dealing out all kinds of new tactics. So it's really important to understand how children are cyberbullied so that you can recognize it and that action can be taken. Um, some of the most common cyberbullying tactics 
Uh, they include posting comments or rumors about someone that are mean, hurtful, or embarrassing in social media sites, uh, threatening to hurt someone or telling them to kill themselves, um, posting mean or hurtful pictures or videos. Um, do we have many young people in the room, Patty? I'm sorry, repeat that again, Gretchen. Do, do we have many young people in the room, like under 18? A, a, a couple young people, yes. Okay, all right. So um, sometimes um, the, the photos are inappropriate um, and they get shared. Um, sometimes uh, the bullies will pretend to be someone else um, so that they can get uh, personal information and then share that in other means. Um, sometimes they'll uh, post hateful things or comments about your uh, race, your religion, um, those ethnicities, those kind of things. Um, sometimes they'll create a whole web page devoted to defaming uh, or, or, or hurting someone. Um, and then there's the issue of doxing. Um, and doxing is an abbreviated uh, form of the word document. And what it is, is online harassment where they take your information, your address, your photo, your um, credit card information, your all kinds of personal documents that typically would be expected to be private, uh, personal information, and it's put out publicly on websites, on social media sites. Um, and, you know, normally that was something that we had seen in the adult world, right? That was something that adults would do to one another, retaliate for, you know, different political views, whatever. Um, and then uh, in 2019, we saw a 17 year old high school student from Kentucky get embroiled in a protest controversy at the Lincoln Memorial. And in uh, multiple celebrities and the national media called for the student to be doxxed. And uh, within minutes, his home address and the name of his school was everywhere. Um, and the threats started coming in, threats of violence, threats of all kinds of things to the extent that protection, police protection had to be sent to the homes of the students and the school had to be closed because this information was put out there and people had a perception of what was happening. And that was done through doxing. So it was a very famous um, sort of situation where it technically is cyberbullying. That's ultimately what it came down to. So um, since we have some young people in the room, I'm gonna kind of slip over the next, uh, jump over the next slide. Um, I'm gonna assume that the parents just read what the title of that was. Um, if you have any questions about what that is specifically, please put those in the chat and we will respond to you appropriately. Or if you'd like, you can, send, um, you can send an email to me and I can address those concerns with you specifically. So, um, but you need to understand parents that that word that was at the top of that previous slide is a very, very big concern. And since a lot of our students went to online platforms, that issue, um, online reporting of that issue has jumped over 800%. So very important to be aware of. So. So what you wanna do, um, you don't wanna respond, but you do. So um, you, you don't wanna to respond to or forward any cyberbullying messages, especially, especially if there are inappropriate images attached to those messages, because you might inadvertently be committing a crime yourself. Um, keep the evidence though of the cyberbullying record the dates, the times, descriptions of what happened, um, print, you know, save and print screenshots. Um, again, if there are those other images, um, just you need to let law enforcement know about that right away so that they can capture it. Um, and then you need to block the person who's doing the cyberbullying. Now, a lot of people don't realize their first line of defense in cyberbullying cases is actually their online service provider. So um, the internet service providers, cell phone service providers, social media sites, they all have policies with regard to cyberbullying. 
So that's actually the first stop. That's where you make that first report. Um, and um, you know, if you're not sure, re review the terms and conditions section through the providers that you're utilizing. Um, and then visit the social media sites and learn how to use their privacy settings so that you can shut those things down. Um, regarding schools, um, report, you know, if it's something that's impacting the child at school, again, remember in Florida, particularly, we do have laws that protect that and can be, you know, those things can be addressed and make sure that if you're reporting something through the school, invite the school resource officer into that conversation because they'll be able to evaluate it and determine what, if any, criminal acts also need to be addressed. And then, um, you know, again, if cyberbullying involves um, threats of violence, um, child pornography, um, inappropriate photos, those types of things, um, or photos where someone should, is, has a complete expectation of privacy, um, stalking, hate crimes, all of those things you need to report to law enforcement. And if it seems like the, um, the law enforcement officer doesn't know quite what to do, then you need to make sure that they can get you in touch with someone in their agency who does know exactly what to do. So here's some additional resources for you. Again, if you wanna go ahead and take a photo of these website addresses, um, there is a plethora of information there that you will find very, very helpful as far as dealing with these issues. Um, and I want you again, go ahead take a picture and um, you know, make sure that you also consider resources that are available through OSHA and the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. Now, um, I'm going to go ahead and switch the slide. If, um, if anybody needs those again, we can, um, you know, we can come back to it. I can send them to you directly. But another resource I want to make you aware of is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration app. And this app is, um, is called no, no Bullying. And this is something where you, it'll help you start to have conversations with your child about the issues of bullying or your, the young adult in your life. Um, because we can't stress enough how the, the impact that this has, the long-term impact that these behaviors have on someone who has been the target or the victim. Um, to the extent that, um, you know, many times professional help is needed, additional assistance is required to help them move beyond what has transpired. So, um, you know, this is a good resource for you. And then with that, I'm going to segue back to Patty because she's going to be able to talk with you about some additional resources. And um, just know that as a member of your police department and Officer Jackson will attest to this as well. We are here, we are at your service. So any questions, any concerns that you have, please do not hesitate to reach out to us and we will help to guide and direct you the best that we can. Thank you so much, Gretchen. I can tell you're very, very passionate about the topic and I'll, I'll be the first to tell you, I am far from a young person, but bullying, it appears from your slides and your presentation, hasn't changed from when I was a child. So, except, of course, the, um, the online presence. That is huge um, since my day. But th I want to thank Gretchen on behalf of the Port St. Lucie Police Department um, and uh, Officer Jackson, who's in the house as well, um, for joining us this evening. Were there any questions from the crowd? Anybody want to ask Gretchen a question? <laughs> I didn't understand that. Gretchen, we, we, ha we have an infant in the, gr in the room and, <laughs> and she's, she's very happy, but I, don't, I didn't understand her question. Um, so uh, we'll move on from there. Um, so, so thank you, Gretchen, very much for uh, joining us tonight. But some of you might be wondering why Parks and Rec is involved in presenting Healthy You and talking about mental health issues. And I'm gonna take a moment and I think there's one lady in the audience who might be aware of this program to celebrate the first time ever that this department is celebrating May is Mental Health Awareness Month is this month. It's the very first time that our department has done this. And there is a flyer that you can find online at PSL, PSLparks.com uh, forward slash healthy you. Um, and it's going to talk all about May 
Mental Health Awareness Month. Now, what this means to us is we have planned nine free programs for our, for our guests, anyone who wants to come. The first one we had last Saturday, and it was very well attended. It was a guided walk out at our beautiful Woodstork Trail Park um, on the east side of town. And our fitness center staff who are passionate and, and just so into mental health and well-being um, guided that uh, fitness center, fitness walk. The next program that we actually offer free again is going to be tomorrow night at 6 p.m. and it's a free yoga class. Now, because I'm not a young person, I, my fitness uh, manager actually reminded me, Patty, remind people because children do yoga, and I didn't realize that, but tomorrow night's class is at 6 o'clock out at Veterans Park at Rivergate um, on Veterans Memorial Parkway, and it, it proceeds throughout the month. It's Thursdays and Saturdays. We have another guided walk on Saturday, May 15th at 830, and that's at Woodland Trails Park. Um, and our last event, uh, free not of the nine events is a yoga class um, at the Palm Tree Garden at the Botanical Gardens. So that's going to be beautiful. So I invite and encourage anyone to come out and join those free events. Um, it is They are truly offered um, for the public. We know this is a tough time. Um, and just to get up and move is, is huge. It will help you immensely. So... Um, one of the other things that I did want to mention that the reason why we do Healthy You is because we can connect people. Again, I just talked about nine free events. There's no charge for any of that. Um, but some of, the, some of the programming that we can offer, and I see we do have one person in the audience that, that this would pertain to. But let's just say right now, even currently, at Minsky Gym, we offer a volleyball mini camp, a basketball development program for ages 15 to 17. We offer m and Sweeties Baton uh, for four-year-olds and up uh, for all girls. We have great kids, um, which are generally high school students. We have an instructional basketball league. Um, in coming months, we're going to have a basketball mini camp and a junior basketball winter season coming up as well. So we've got a lot of things um, that uh, the public, we invite you to join us. I also, for those in person, um, handed out our May calendar as well as a annual brochure. So uh, I did not even mention a, a mere token of all that we offer, but please look through them. They're e all either free or very reasonably priced. Um, and mental health and well being has never been so important as what we're coming out of right now. Um, so please feel free to look at that. But um, before, during, and after this global crisis, your parks and recreation team has been and will be hard at work for you. And we do appreciate the opportunity to present just a glimpse into what we have to offer our guests so that they can thrive and prosper. I truly hope that you will consider joining us again for session number eight of Healthy You, where we will discuss with another subject matter expert, the topic of gender violence. That session will be held right here in this same room and offered same way through Zoom on Wednesday, June 2nd from 6.30 to 8. And I surely hope to see you all there and maybe sh uh, spread the word amongst your friends as well. So I will close. The Par Port St. Lucie Parks and Recreation Department is honored and privileged to have the daily opportunity to provide this community with parks, amenities, and programs which increase the quality of life in this city and enable our residents and ourselves to learn, grow, and serve every day. Thank you all for coming out um, very much for your time. I hope um, you took away some, some great tidbits on, on bullying and how that can um, help you moving forward. And I wish you all a, a safe evening. Thank you for coming.